Hello and welcome to Reportage. This is Danish Bin Nabi. In today's segment of Reportage, I am joined by author and historian Mr. Sugata Bose to talk about his recently released book Asia After Europe. The book talks about the Asianness, the idea of Asia, and the people of Asia. Let's listen into Mr. Bose. M- Mr. Bose, explain to the viewers. For the viewers, I am just asking if we check, if we look at your book, the underlining factor. The underlining theme of the book is this Asianness. Explain it for the viewers what this Asianness is. Well, um, I decided to write a book um, about identities and affinities that transcended the borders of uh, European colonies and nation states. Uh, there were many solidarities uh, that were forged uh, through what I have called the long 20th century among people uh, who belonged to different countries of Asia. And they all uh, tried uh, to provide a sense of Asian-ness. And part of that, of course, had to do with uh, European colonial domination uh, in much of Asia uh, that uh, had to be resisted. But, you know, even European geographers, cartographers uh, had written about Asia, had drawn maps of Asia, but they had created something of what has been called the myth of continents. I tried to show how Asians uh, imagined their own continent. And that imagination, in my view, had a creative spark, uh, which was lacking uh, in uh, European geographic and cartographic depictions of our continent. So really, this is a book about uh, many kinds of uh, political, cultural, artistic, uh, uh, and uh, uh, cultural conversations taking place uh, among Asians Asians, uh, across borders uh, from about uh, 1880 uh, all the way to the present. Explain it for the viewers, which areas you are talking about? Is it only South Asia? Is it Southeast Asia? Southwest Asia, Central Asia, which are these areas which basically comprise of this Asia? First of all, uh, I have been more interested in the idea of Asia rather than the map of Asia. That is because I did not want to write a history centering around colonies or nation states. Uh, I wanted to write a history of uh, connections uh, across Asia. But what I can say for your viewers is that I do not restrict myself uh, to South Asia or East Asia. I don't even uh, restrict myself to what are the larger and the more famous countries of Asia, uh, such as uh, India, China, and Japan, even though there is a lot about uh, relations between India and China, India and Japan, Japan and China in this book. I encompass uh, all of Asia, uh, West Asia, Southeast Asia figure very prominently. You will find that there are sections where I talk about uh, the connections between Turkey in the western extremity of Asia and Japan in the eastern extremity of Asia. Just to give you an example, uh, there was Abdul Rashid Ibrahim who traveled all the way uh, from the Ottoman domains uh, to Japan in the early uh, 20th century. And he had connections with someone from South Asia who taught Hindustani in Tokyo University, Muhammad Bukatullah. Uh, But I also pay very close attention to rather neglected Southeast Asian countries and their contributions to the 
definition and to the imagination of Asia. Just to give a couple of examples, the Filipino patriot, uh, Jose Rizal, uh, who traveled to Japan uh, in the 1890s before he was executed by the Spanish, or uh, a pirating Vietnamese nationalist, Phan Boi Chao, uh, who also traveled from Vietnam to Japan in 1905. And there he met Chinese and Indian and Filipino and Turkish uh, anti-colonial activists in what was then an anti-colonial metropolis of Tokyo. Mr. Bosk, I completely get the picture, the uh, picture you have drawn. But just out of curiosity, I want to know this. Uh, the Asian countries, we have resources, we have culture, we have people to people contact, we have good economy if we see m many different countries. But why have we Asians failed to build or to rather construct something like a model, like a European Union thing? Why have we failed to do it? Uh, first, let me take you back a little. Um, you're completely right that we have so much uh, in terms of resources and potential. Uh, one of the myths that I debunk in this book, uh, that uh, Asian poverty was somehow ancient. Uh, I show that uh, Asia fell into poverty and Europe and the West grew rich uh, from about the second decade of the 19th century onwards. That is when the great divergence took place uh, in the economic fortunes of Europe and Asia. And it came about as a result of uh, the European ability to manipulate some of the intra-Asian connections. For example, in the early 19th century, the British used to pay for China tea with Indian opium. So they were reordering relations within Asia in such a way that it would benefit them. Uh, there was a historian, K. N. Choudhury, uh, who wrote a book titled Asia Before Europe, uh, where he had written about the economic dynamism of Asia up to uh, the uh, end of the uh, 18th century. And I write about Asia after Europe, you know, what happened after European colonial domination. What I show is that from the late 19th century up until the middle of the 20th century, there were many creative efforts that were made uh, to forge links, uh, build alliances. Uh, there were lots of intimacies and affinities among Asians, all trying to work towards the resurgence of Asia. Uh, after having been defeated by European colonial powers. But what I also uh, am able to track uh, is that, you know, once uh, most of these Asian countries uh, won uh, independence, uh, we seemed to have uh, decided to continue to subscribe to European concepts of sovereignty and borders. And that's why we came to fetishize the nation state model, which our own anti-colonial nationalists had never fully accepted as the norm. And that I think continued particularly for about 40 or so years after, let us say, the independence of India in 1947. But after that, from the late 20th century onwards, there has been some degree of, uh, of a reconnection across Asia. You talked about Europe, uh, how European the, uh, built a union, but the European Union is also facing lots of problems. There is a great deal to learn from Europe about how a union can be forged even after the carnage of two world wars. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the European Union project was a little too state-driven, uh, and it was in some ways run by bureaucrats from Brussels, which is why it has run into some problems today. 
in some ways, it is just as well that Asian ideas of uh, forging connections, learning from one another is less state driven, even though I accept that uh, diplomats and political leaders must in fact pick up some of the more creative ideas put forward by Asian intellectuals and scholars, if we are to have genuine prosperity in what is being uh, called an Asian century. Mr. Bose, point well taken. You have mentioned two wars. One, Japanese invasion of China in 1937 and Chinese invasion of India in 1962. But what, but the first, let's talk about the first war, Japanese invasion of China in 1937. Did that undermine the Asianness? Did that undermine the idea of Asia? How fatal was that war between these two Asian giants? Uh, yes, it, it did. Uh, what the invasion of uh, mainland China by Japan in 1937 showed was that Asia was by no means immune from the European virus of uh, conflicts uh, between nation states. Uh, and it did uh, undermine uh, the idea of Asia as never before. Now, uh, most Asians had greatly admired uh, Japan uh, from the beginning of the 20th century onwards. After all, this was a country uh, that had been subjected to unequal treaties by Europe uh, from the 1850s, but had broken free uh, of them, uh, had uh, modernized in a dramatic way during the Meiji period from 1868 onwards. It had militarily defeated Russia in 1905. And so many uh, in uh, Turkey and India and uh, Vietnam, even China, you know, the great Chinese reformers, Kang Yu Wei and Liang Qiqiao were in Tokyo from uh, uh, the late 19th century onwards in the early 20th century. And yet, uh, you know, Japan's decision during that depression decade did create very many problems. For example, uh, our great poet, Rabindranath Tagore, uh, was great friends with a uh, Japanese poet, uh, Yone Noguchi, whom he had met in Japan in 1916, 1924, 1929, and so on, and had warmly received Noguchi in Shantini in November of 1935. But when Japan invaded China, uh, Tagore uh, wrote uh, to Noguchi, and I discuss a very fascinating experience change of letters between these two poets on the Japan-China conflict of that period. Shubhash Chandra Bose, who was president of the Indian National Congress in 1938, sent an Indian medical mission to China uh, because at that stage he felt that our sympathies should be with the victim of an aggression. But I also show how the context changed with the onset of the Second World War. And uh, it was important at that point uh, to take advantage of the international war crisis by colonized countries in, in South and Southeast Asia to free themselves from British, French, Dutch, and American colonial rule. So I show the various shifting contexts. And by doing so, I underscore the factors which tended to help forge Asian unity. And I also show what the factors were that tended to fracture Asian solidarity. Mr. Bose, if we look at our Indian nationalism, Indian history, history of Indian nationalism, we see that Nehru was also interested in this Asianist idea of Asia. What were his contributions to the idea of Asia? And what was basically his vision post-1947, what was his vision about this idea of Asia? Even before uh, we uh, got independence in August of 1947, uh, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru uh, had hosted an Asian relations conference uh, in Delhi 
uh, in April of that uh, year. And I discussed that in some detail. It was not only Nehru's idea, uh, as he himself acknowledged, many Asian leaders were thinking on those terms uh, when he had uh, stopped in Burma uh, uh, a year before, uh, Aung San had suggested to Nehru that there should be a conference of uh, this kind. My own grandfather, Sharath Chandra Bose, also visited Burma in July of 1946, along with my father, and they too had talked about the importance of building uh, Asian uh, unity. And uh, so Nehru did make this very important contribution, but I also mention others. The, uh, the person who presided uh, over the Asian Relations Conference was our poet-politician, Sarojini Naidu. And she had been meant to preside over an all-Asian women's conference in Lahore in 1931. She could not because she was then imprisoned for taking part in Mahatma Gandhi's civil disobedience movement. But she did uh, uh, you know, preside in 1947, and she made a couple of beautiful inspirational speeches uh, about the nature of uh, Asian unity. What is the gold of Asian consciousness? And she said that uh, we don't need a monotonous culture. We don't need a uniform culture. Uh, and uh, uh, she was uh, able to articulate in poetic terms uh, how, in fact, Asian unity could be built by respecting the diversity of this uh, continent. And she ended by saying that there was meant to be another uh, Asian relations conference in two years time in China, which was never held because there was the communist revolution there. Um, but uh, she had said that, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is going to happen in China and ha hadn't the prophet of Islam said, go as far as China to gain knowledge and so on. So there were many people who were taking part in this effort to, to build uh, Asia. Mahatma Gandhi himself uh, came to the Purana Killa at the time of the Asian Relations Conference, and he begged the visitors from other Asian countries not to take back memories of the awful carnage that was taking place in certain parts of India at that time, uh, and instead you know, wanted to focus on what Asia truly meant and what it could teach both Europe and the world. And I've also discussed the Bandung uh, conference, uh, and I have offered my own interpretation of that conference, where, of course, uh, Nehru was leading the Indian delegation. But there were many others, too, uh, who played a very important part in 1955. Mr. Post, you have drawn, drawn a picture, a blueprint of about this idea of Asia. But from Nehru to Naidu, Sarojini Naidu to Subhash Chandra Bose to Mahatma Gandhi, if everyone, if every leader from other countries, to be it China, Japan, every leader wanted this idea, wanted this concept to flourish. What what happened actually? Why did it not go ahead? What was the what was that tipping point which which with which it completely broke down? Well, um, first of all, I think it's important to uh, recognize uh, that there were many efforts underway, uh, certainly before independence of the various Asian countries, including India in 1947. And some of these efforts uh, continued for at least a decade after 1947. And I would say somewhat successfully. Um, because um, it's not just that the newly independent states were trying to get together. Bandung was a gathering of leaders of the states. You know, Sukarno was the host uh, in Indonesia. Uh, Chiu Enlai was there from China. Uh, Nehru uh, was leading uh, India. Uh, but there were others who also made important contributions at uh, Bandung. But it had a bit of a statist quality to it. 
the representatives of freedom struggles were not there. After all, most of Africa was not yet free, and this was meant to be an Asian-African conference. Even uh, uh, Malaysia, just across from Indonesia, had not yet won Merdeka or, or freedom and so on. But what I show in my book is that in addition to these efforts by states, there were many more, shall we say, civil society initiatives. I write about so many unofficial conferences and gatherings in different countries, in India and China, even Burma. Rangoon was a great cosmopolitan venue in the early 1950s of Asian socialists uh, coming together. But as I mentioned, ultimately, the managers of the, of the states decided to emphasize post-colonial continuity rather than build on the best in anti-colonial Asian thought. So therefore, they began to imitate the European nation-state model, which was really constructed on a concept of unitary sovereignty, of hard borders. And therefore, as soon as they did that, they began to enter into various kinds of territorial disputes. Uh, they began to behave just as the European nation states had in the first half of the 20th century. And that is why I actually am able to narrate the quite dramatic story of this kind of a bonhomie among various Asian countries in the 1950s. But then you have a bitter border war between India and China in uh, 1962. I will, I will that, come to that course, question and conclude the interview with that. You continue, please. Yes, so, uh, but I would still say that uh, you say it completely ended everything. It, it did not quite. Uh, yes, the heyday of the European model of the nation state in Asia uh, lasted from a, for about, you know, shall we say the second half of the, uh, of, of the 20th century. But I think um, there were new connections that began to be forged. Uh, there were efforts to learn from one another uh, at the turn of the uh, 21st century. In fact, I may have written a more optimistic book, or at least my book may have had a more optimistic conclusion uh, had it been written 10 years ago. Uh, but, you know, some of what we were seeing in terms of uh, rather broad-minded, generous moves towards rebuilding Asian connections, these have actually suffered something of a setback in the last decade. And I explained that, but I'm trying to suggest that, you know, there are many different kinds of inheritances that we can take from Asia's past on our uncertain journey ahead. And I have identified the ones that will be better for us and others which are best avoided uh, if we are to continue to build on Asian peace and prosperity. Mr. Bose, point completely well taken. Let me now uh, uh, ask you the last question so that we end up this long, intriguing discussion. What about this China-India war, 1962? Was it the last nail in coffin as far as the idea of Asia is concerned? No, I, I, I don't think, you know, history has any kind of an end point. Uh, it was certainly uh, a huge setback uh, for the idea of Asia to find fulfillment uh, in the era of uh, Asian independence, which had began, uh, which had begun in the uh, late uh, 1940s. And of course, uh, there was a long period of even uh, diplomatic uh, non-engagement between these two uh, Asian giants. But I also tell quite fascinating stories uh, about, you know, unofficial visits, which again began from the late 1970s, even before uh, political diplomatic relations began to improve 
For example, I talk about Moitre Devi, who took along with her um, uh, Rabindranath Tagore's talks in China when she paid a visit after Mao's death. And just as China was again beginning to uh, beginning to open up. And uh, what I will say is that, you know, China also has to bear a, a large degree of uh, responsibility. I discuss in my final uh, chapter uh, some very thoughtful remarks made by the Chinese historian based in Singapore, Wang Gang Wu. He wrote a book called Renewal in 2013. And he said that there are two very different directions that China can take as the prospective leader of some kind of an Asian resurgence, that there has been an economic rise of Asia, there can be no doubt about. There has been. And the global balance, which had shifted against Asia 200 years ago, is now being restored in Asia's favor. But will we be able to make the most of it? Uh, and there, uh, you know, what China does is going to be very important. If it goes on the path of a nationalistic imperialism, then I think the Asian idea will not find fulfillment. If, in fact, um, there is a different route that China takes, for example, Wang Gangwu mentioned a very important classical thinker called Hu Hong Ming, whom uh, the Indian visitor, Vinay Kumar Sharp, had met in China in 1915. And Gu Hongming's idea of uh, a more generous empire, Tianxia, a moral universality idea that was gaining ground in China maybe 15 years ago. But it has again sort of been overshadowed. But as I mentioned that, uh, you know, unfortunately, the conflict between Japan and China in 1937 had undermined the uh, idea of Asia in the 20th century. And if, in fact, in the 21st century, Asia is to achieve the full potential of uh, the peace and prosperity that uh, should be uh, its uh, uh, destiny, uh, then India and China will have to uh, peacefully manage their simultaneous rise. And this book, Asia After Europe, suggests that there are enough resources, historical resources, ideas uh, you know, about a pluralized continentalism in Asia that are available, which we can draw on to make sure that the Asian century uh, truly uh, achieves its full potential. Mr. Boss, we do hope that Asian century, this dream comes as much sooner as possible. Let me hold your book once again for the reader so that it reaches maximum people. And I hope that people do read your book. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. And here it is from my end. Please subscribe to our channel Reportage and press the bell icon to remain updated.